Okay, there we go. So I know in the back, you probably cannot see this. In fact, you definitely cannot see it, even from the front. It's a traffic cop giving a ticket to a butterfly. And the cop is looking at his license, and on the license, it's a caterpillar. And the butterfly says, it's an old picture. <laughs> so what we've really come to talk about is transformation. And tomorrow, we're going to do quite a bit of writing. So I'll try to keep the lecture to the evening satsangs so that people who aren't in the program can also experience part of it. And then we'll do the writing in the afternoons. I want to start with a quote from the American poet William Wordsworth. It, it comes from a poem that's called Ode, Intimations of Immortality. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, hath elsewhere its setting, and cometh from afar not in entire forgetfulness, not in entire forgetfulness, and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come. And I believe that that's true. It's not even metaphor, because sometimes the light breaks through. Um, I know lots of people in the medical profession who work in delivery rooms who sometimes see the light when a child is born. I saw that when my first son was born. It was just surrounded by light, those light trails with us. And of course, we see it too when people leave on the other end. And then in between, we have this dream called life. And what's interesting about this dream is that it seems very, very real. And oftentimes what happens is things that go on in our life we think are happening to us without realizing that the soul is really, it's a meaning-making organ. And that not only can we sometimes change the course of our life, but we can always see it in a different way that allows us to adjust our vision and see those trails of glory that are there. So, we're born, there's the glory, and then life happens. And we need to learn how to make meaning out of our world. Here's another cartoon that you probably can't see. A very good friend of mine who's a, a wonderful teacher of meditation and imagination sent it to me at Christmas. She and I are both Jewish, and so it's a great Christmas card to send to your Jewish friends, if that makes any sense. But what we have here is the three wise men who have schlepped all the way from Persia following a star. And so they're moaning and groaning, oi vey, my feet hurt, my arthritis, what was I thinking? There is Mary who says, ugh, I wanted a girl. <laughs> There's Joseph who's worrying, how am I going to feed another mouth? And then, of course, the baby is affected by the vibration around him, and he's screaming. And so it's amazing how in this place of forgetfulness <laughs> that is this life, even a miracle can be missed. So the idea here is how can we wake up again and make a beautiful meaning out of our uh, life? And by the way, the caption of this, instead of the nativity scene, it says the negativity scene. So how do we have faith? I mean, here we are at an ashram, and in an ashram, we're trying to rediscover that inner light when we rest a little bit and we take away some of the stress and some of the worries. The idea is that light is our true identity. It's always been there. And there's a, a you know, wonderful 
wonderful uh, piece from the Gita, and it talks about how that that inner self, that inner light, can't be destroyed. It can't be sullied. Whatever you do, it's incorruptible, and it can't be burned by fire or cut by a knife or crushed by a rock because it's the true identity of who we are. And the reason that we come is to catch a glimpse of that identity and hope that we keep catching glimpses until we get more established in that particular place within us. And we're here maybe because we have some faith that that might happen. And I wanted to read you one of my favorite poems from David White. Anybody here a fan of the poet David White? Several of you. He's, he's written some lovely books. This poem is called Faith. I want to write about faith. I want to write about faith, about the way the moon rises over cold snow night after night, faithful even as it fades from fullness, slowly becoming that last curving and impossible sliver of light before the final darkness. But I have no faith myself Refuse it even the smallest entry. Let this then, my small poem, like a new moon, slender and barely open, be the first prayer that opens me to faith. And so my prayer for all of us in this new year is that the faith we have in our own true goodness blossoms that we truly, truly are able to love ourselves. And if that happens, I'll tell you, the whole world will change. And it really needs it right now. So this particular slide was written by someone called Philip Yancey, but essentially it's a rewrite of something that Kierkegaard once said. Uh, Kierkegaard said, the thing with life is that you can only understand it backwards, but the problem is you've got to live it forwards. <laughs> and so what this Philip Yancey has um, made into this lovely slide is I've learned that faith means trusting in advance what will only make sense in reverse. So when we take to write our life story, one of the interesting things I've found in the years that I've been doing this is at 70, I was 70 a couple of months ago, um, you start to get a pretty long vision looking back and all of a sudden, things that were difficult fall into place and make sense. And then you have uh, a sense of faith, I see what's happening here, uh, a sense of faith that begins to really blossom from that. So let's talk about story because you can't turn on the news without hearing the word narrative. Have you noticed how that's taken over like in the last oh, five years or so? Everybody has a narrative, they have a story. And in fact, we create the world through story. That's one of uh, the most basic things that we find in most spiritual traditions is the understanding that we are who, who, not who we think we are. There's something else under there, but we create our identity through story. So here's something from the New Testament, from John uh, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, hold that thought about creation because I need to fix this. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It was all vibration, all the source, all keter, the sphere of the unmanifest, the will, the logos. And how did that which was unmanifest become duality? How did that happen? Well, 
Every tradition has a different way of looking at that. But as a kid, we used to say the words of creation without knowing what they were. Did you ever use the words abracadabra when you were little? Make magic happen? So abracadabra is actually the Aramaic expression of intentional manifestation. I will create abra as I speak kadabra. So we create our reality with the stories that we tell ourselves, with the words that we speak. Now, who here is a student of Jungian psychology? Anybody? Jungians? There are a few of you. And so you'll recognize the name James Hillman, who's a wonderful Jungian teacher and author. And it was from him that I learned the word healing fiction. And this is the way I like to define that. Stories we tell ourselves that make sense of the word, world, true or not, they make a positive difference in how we live our lives. And so um, I'm going to tell you a story and then the healing fiction that I have around it as an example. And if you've heard me speak before, it's possible you might have heard this story, but good stories always are good to retell. So when I was 10, I, um, I saw a scary movie. My mother took me to a movie, and she didn't realize it was going to be scary. But it had snakes and scorpions and, and blowguns and things that frightened a 10-year-old imagination. And over the next week, I started to have dreams about it, nightmares about scenes from this movie. And I thought that people with blowguns were appearing in the house and they were going to kill my parents and my brother with, with poison darts. And I was absolutely terrified. And in the mornings, I'd shake out my shoes to get rid of potential scorpions in the winter in Boston. You can see this was not reasonable. <laughs> um, and in any case, I, w I got... Uh, terribly mentally ill. I was psychotic and I started to hallucinate these scenes during the day until I no longer could tell what reality was. And the mind is an amazing place. And what it did was to create a second mental illness to organize the first. And that was obsessive compulsive disorder. And I developed the belief system and that if I did a certain number of rituals, like hand washing, that's a common one, then that would keep the headhunters from killing my family and everything would be well. And so my life became nothing but rituals. They kept growing in number until I finally had to leave school because I developed a, a belief that one ritual had to be that all my reading had to be done upside down. The books had to go upside down. And that means backwards, upside down and backwards. And repeated three times without interruption. And so that was my whole life. I had time for nothing but rituals. And I can't even begin to explain to you the terror that was involved because I felt I was the only one who could see the headhunters, and everyone would die if I fell down on my responsibility. What happened was um, one day, about six months into this, I decided it might help to pray. I did not come from a prayerful family. I came from a secular Jewish family, and no prayer happened in our house. But I did go to a Jewish girls camp in the summer. And there I had sat in the pine grove and we had chanted beautiful songs. I love to chant in Sanskrit. I love to chant in Hebrew. Give me chanting. It's a, it's a great thing. And I touched something during that time. I'd become part of something. And it occurred to me, well, we prayed at camp. Maybe I should pray. And so I said the prayer of the broken heart, which is, if there's anything out there, if anything is listening, please help me because I cannot help myself. And at that moment, what happened was the absolute terror 
was replaced by perfect peace. There is a line in the Bible about the peace that passeth understanding. And you really can't describe it. It's like having an experience of non-duality and trying to put it into words. It's not something you can express in words. And so there I was in this perfect peace and surrounded by such love, such amazing, breathtaking love, and also a, a, a great sense of intuition, of wisdom uh, beyond myself. And I knew absolutely and positively that I could recover from the mental illness. And I also understood precisely how to do it, which story I will not tell. If you're interested, ask me tomorrow when we're walking around or after the, um, after the 12 o'clock session. So I did, um, I did what came to me and what it was, what came to me was a poem, not a poem that somebody else wrote, a poem that came from the divine that I knew, I wrote it down and I knew if I would say this poem it would bring me back to the state where there was no fear. And I did that for three or four days, and then the whole episode was gone. However, it left me with many questions, um, and that's why, in a way, it shaped who I am today, is that's when I got interested in psychology. So I think anybody with an illness when they're young has a fantasy that they'll grow up and they'll help other kids who have an illness like that, so I wanted to study psychology. I was also interested in the brain science of it, and of course in the spiritual experience, because I knew enough to know it was that. But the story that other people told about it might not have been um, so positive, and then the story I told myself. So I went to therapy later in my life for other reasons, and the therapist said, aren't you afraid that this will happen again and that you will go crazy? And actually, it hadn't really occurred to me that it would happen again <laughs> because I'd had this incredible experience. I felt so blessed by it. But this therapist started to tell me the story, it could happen again, it could happen again. You have to watch out, it could happen again. And I started to worry about that and got myself pretty anxious and worked up. And finally, somebody came along who said, you know, you are a healer by birth. That's what you do. And every healer has some kind of shamanic experience where their world explodes. They get terribly sick and they have to like Humpty Dumpty put themselves back together again. And in the process of that experience, something changed in you because that's the gift you're going to give to the world. So it's not something wrong with your brain that's going to pounce out and get you again in the night. It's a gift from God. It's your vocation. It was the call to your vocation. And that's the, quote, healing fiction that I choose to believe. That's the story of my mental illness. So. So far, so good. 60 years later, and there are no headhunters. So life, life is good. So because of that experience and many other experiences, I, I came up with a possibility that I think is good to entertain, and that is this. What if the seeds of your soul's becoming were hidden in the very stories of your life that cause you pain and limitation? What if telling your story from the perspective of the soul caused those sacred seeds to germinate? What about that? And of course you'll find in every culture people who have wonderful things to say about this. For instance, the French Jesuit paleontologist Tylog de Chardin said that we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And I really do believe that. Uh, I believe that every one of us is evolving to who we are. And every tradition, too, looks to say, well, 
how come we go through this period of human life where if we if we're already whole if we already know it and you know what they all have something different to say but here we are and we get clues and we get hints about that light which has accompanied us from the very beginning and accompanies us out at the end personally i love the explanation best in the talmud for why we're all here and having this experience and the talmud says it very clearly we're here because god loves stories so <laughs> this is a workshop where we get to tell our stories there was a wonderful poet uh, and philosopher by the name of john o'donohue who died a few years back who knew who knows the writings of john o'donohue so again just a few of you he's wonderful my goodness he's a wonderful irish irish poet with such a deep soul so he wrote this he said your identity is not equivalent to your biography there is a place in you where you have never been wounded where there's a seamlessness in you where there's a confidence and tranquility in you and i think the intention of prayer and spirituality and love is now again to visit that inner kind of sanctuary so that's the place that holds the light that's the place that cannot be sullied or crushed by a rock or burned by a fire that's the place where you can be forgiven again and again and again because that's your true nature and it's lovely to hear that but the question always is how do you realize that how do you get there so that's ultimately what we're talking about meanwhile the whole field of psychology and neuroscience has gotten very involved with storytelling and narrative and there's a brand new field called narrative medicine you can even take a master's degree at columbia uh, in narrative medicine and they have people from every kind of health care and even corporate people now enrolling in that program to understand how your narrative really shapes your life so what's narrative medicine well there's a wonderful psychiatrist and neuroscientist by the name of dan siegel all right who knows dan siegel okay more of you know dan siegel i'm always interested to know who who is familiar um, with what because it helps me to shape what i say for for more of you so dan siegel wrote that narrative medicine what is it it's creating a larger context for your story that lets you find the nobility within yourself and share it and for me you know the great the great stories of finding that inner self what more nobility can you find what no more nobility can you find to say that you are so worthwhile because i do believe that the great wound of western culture is worthlessness um, that we don't we we often do not love ourselves this by the way i remember once um, a conversation that i didn't have it but it was reported in a book with his holiness the dalai lama and his holiness uh was having a dialogue with neuroscientists and psychologists which he's very fond of doing and someone said well how do we get over that sense of not loving ourselves not thinking we're worthwhile and he could not compute it he just didn't understand it it was so lacking um, from his perspective that anybody could ever think that way and so he, he he after his shock that was the conversation well how did that happen to so many people it's it's not our true state of being so it happens though we fall asleep so i grew up in a little town called brookline massachusetts and it was not far from cambridge and harvard or newton massachusetts and there there were a couple of harvard professors timothy leary 
and Richard Alpert, who had a house in Newton, and they were doing research with LSD. And they said, you know, it helps you discover this part of yourself that has been lost. And so they got very excited and began to study that in the psychology department. But then it was psychology and social relations at Harvard. And unfortunately, um, and they had, they had permission to do these studies, but no Harvard students could be involved. Unfortunately, one Harvard student sneaked into the study somehow, and they both ended up getting fired actually by a very good friend of mine later in life, uh, Professor David McClelland, who was the chair at that time. And then Ram Das, I mean Richard Alpert, went off to India and found his guru. And his guru said, give me the LSD, I'll take it. And nothing happened because the guru said there was nothing to happen. I'm in that state to start with <laughs> and aware of that place within me. But Ramda said, well, I'm not. And I've, I've glimpsed it with the LSD, but I haven't become established in that state. And so he became uh, Neem Karoli Baba's disciple. And still in all, it's a long journey, isn't it? <laughs> I haven't made it there yet. I have an occasional glimpse, which is wonderful. I know that state exists, but how do you get there? And I think narrative medicine is part of that. And it's wonderful because it's great for a secular society. How did Ram Das get more established in that state? He had a stroke. And one story he could have told himself is, my God, this is terrible. Ram Das was a kind of cool dude. He liked sports cars, um, good things in life. He had a tremendous aesthetic. He was uh, born to a wealthy family. And then he had all these amazing experiences in his life. And then he had not a small stroke, but a really serious stroke and ended up wheelchair bound. And a lot of people who have a story like that will continue to tell themselves, I've lost everything. My life isn't worth living. This is a terrible thing. But for him, it was actually an awakening because he told himself a very different story. I heard him teach via Skype at a conference a couple of years ago, and it was really beautiful. And of course, Ram Das was a major wordsmith, so articulate. Um, one of these people, you could just sit at his feet because what came through him was always a transmission, so beautiful. And he lost the ability to speak. And over the many years, he's regained his ability to speak, but his speech is very slow, about a word at a time. And so you have to enter an altered state and be patient just to receive what he says. But more than the words, his presence has started to shine. That inner light, that story that we need to rewrite has really come through him in a major way. So there he was on Skype and he kept pointing to his heart. He was talking about identity. What's your identity as a human being? He kept pointing to his heart with such a look of peaceful bliss on his face. And he said, I am loving awareness. I am loving awareness. I am loving awareness. Until finally it became contagious and watching it, you got it yourself. I am loving awareness. And so he then talked about entering the realm of the soul and letting go of the fixed identities we have that are attached to the past, what happened or didn't happen, and the future, what might happen, but who knows. So back in the day, 
when um, I was working in a hospital during the 80s, I had founded a mind-body clinic at one of the Harvard teaching hospitals. And I was working in the department of Herbert Benson, uh, Dr. Herbert Benson, who first brought meditation to medicine. And of course, he was studying uh, meditation from a lot of different uh, points of view and different traditions. And one of the traditions that had popped up right in the Boston area was the Buddhist tradition. And over at Cambridge City Hospital, we had a young psychologist, Jack Cornfield. Who's ever studied with Jack or knows Jack's work? Well, he's wonderful. And that was the point when the, the Barry Center um, for Meditation, for Mindfulness, was taking shape. And we had all these wonderful young American Buddhist teachers, including John Kabat-Zinn, bringing forth mindfulness, which is now, you've got to say, <laughs> it's, it has really taken off, not only in the United States, but all over the world. And so Jack, uh, Jack would come and, and give journal clubs and teach us. And Jack is still out there teaching. And recently I heard Jack give a teaching, uh, and this comes from it, from the recent teaching of Jack's. So he gave a context from a Time Magazine article, and Jack said, here was the article, after more than a century of looking for it, brain researchers have long since concluded that there's no conceivable place for a self to be located in the physical brain. And Jack's commentary was absolutely Buddhist, uh, anatta. He said, self is quite malleable. There is no fixed self. But we're constantly creating self with the stories we tell, the beliefs we have, and what we choose to identify with. And so here's my thought. I know that there's no self. I know that healing fictions are just temporary stops on the train but I'd rather tell myself a good story until I discover <laughs> that light within. So I want to define spirituality for you briefly because all of this narrative medicine is coming together from a variety of different sources from the mindfulness source, from the neurobiology source, from the news. Everything is converging, really, into a new story. And I'll read you this because I know you certainly can't read the print there. But it's a quote from a paper called Positive Emotions, Spirituality and the Practice of Psychiatry by George Valiant, who's a psychiatrist at Harvard. And Dr. Valiant, you can look this up on the internet, Valiant, V-A-I-L-L-A-N-T. It's really spelled Valent. And if you look up Valent and spirituality, you'll get this whole paper. So this is a bit from the introduction. This paper proposes that eight positive emotions, awe, love, trust, or faith, compassion, gratitude, forgiveness, joy, and hope, constitute what we mean by spirituality. These emotions have been grossly ignored by psychiatry. Spirituality is not about ideas, sacred texts, and theology. Rather, spirituality is all about emotion and social connection. Our whole concept of psychotherapy might change if clinicians set about enhancing positive emotions rather than focusing only on negative emotions. And so my hope when we do our writing together over these next few days is alchemy, that we take whatever negative stories and emotions, at least one or two of them that we might have, and we retell our stories in a way that brings us to that place where we experience compassion, gratitude, forgiveness, joy, and hope, when we feel a sense of awe and of love and of faith. And I think that's a very, very good place to start because once we put ourselves on that frequency and on that vibration, amazing, amazing synchronicities start to happen and people come into our lives 
and suddenly the road opens in front of us in a whole new way because this is what we're holding in our hearts as the intention for our lives. So a little bit about darkness and light. So who's read Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning? So he's the most popular one of everybody that I've mentioned, even though his book is old. You know, right after 9-11, um, I traveled to New York on, uh, I think, the, the first or second day that the planes were flying again out of Denver. And it was an amazing thing. Practically everybody on that plane, it seemed, was carrying a copy of Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, because they were looking for a way to make meaning out of something horrible that had happened. And I said at the very beginning when we started that for me, when I think about the soul, one of the definitions of soul is it's the organ the organ of the human that creates meaning. You know, we have a heart that pumps blood. We have kidneys that filter blood. We have a brain uh, that coordinates things and thinks. But there's something about the soul that's configured to create meaning. So Viktor Frankl, what is to give light must endure burning. What is to give light must endure burning. And this is a little, little bit from his book. And try to hear it with the ears of your heart, not to read it or think about it, but to let it seep into your cells and maybe em embody it a bit. And it, think about the fact this guy survived, what, three different Nazi death camps? It was really an amazing story that he survived it all. And he survived because of a story that he was telling himself. And the story was there's a meaning for being in these death camps because what I've seen here, what I've experienced here has taught me about resilience. And I'm going to get out of the camps because I'm meant to be a teacher of resilience, which is exactly what he did. And it was that story, that particular healing fiction that kept him alive. So here's a quote now. A man who has experienced something so terrible, so awful, writes this. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it's set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers, the truth that love is the ultimate and highest goal to which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. And it's amazing to me that that particular light came out of that depth of darkness. And so this now is a preliminary to maybe a little exercise that we'll do together tonight. <clears throat> and now I'm going to be quoting Brene, Brene Brown. How many of you are enjoying Brene Brown? She is very cool. So. Brene Brown writes a lot about vulnerability, and she also writes about courage. And here she's talking about heartbreak and what I think of as heart speak. She says, courage is a heart word. The root of the word courage is core, the Latin word for heart. In one of its earliest forms, the word courage meant to speak one's mind by telling all one's heart. To speak one's mind by telling all one's heart. Over time, the definition has changed. And today, we typically associate courage with heroic and brave deeds. But in my opinion, this definition fails to recognize the inner strength and level of commitment required 
for us to actually speak honestly and openly about who we are and about our experiences, good and bad. Speaking from our hearts is what I think of as ordinary courage. And there's going to be quite a bit of that happening in the workshop part of this as we share our writings, as we share some of the stories that don't serve us anymore, and as we rewrite them into stories that now do serve us. What a great thing to do at New Year's. What a perfect time of year for that. We let go of the old and we welcome the new. And we do that best in the company and in the shelter of one another. It is amazing to me how healing it is to be witnessed in my stories by somebody who's open-minded and open-hearted and who doesn't judge but is just there. And the uh, Celtic word for a person like that is an anamkara, a soul friend. And so uh, that's what I'm hoping is going to happen here, that we're going to be anamkaras, soul friends to one another. And so anybody who's going to be, well, you're all at the beginning of the workshop, whether you take the rest of it or not, We'll do a little exercise together in a minute. And I need you all to pledge to confidentiality. So what happens at the ashram stays at the ashram. Can you do it? Yes? Because that's the only way we can feel safe if everybody agrees to that. So there are three soul questions that we're going to consider in the next six or seven minutes or so. And this is a little bit like speed dating. You need a different partner for each question. So look around. There's a little bit of logistics to find yourself a partner. And it would be good if you did it in twos. It's harder in threes because there's not really enough time because you're only going to have about 90 seconds for each question. So can everybody turn around and identify a partner? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Don't start yet. What we're going to do is this. This is a monologue, a monologue, meaning one person speaks and the other person just listens. You can ho and hum. You can nod. You can laugh. You can swoon, but don't say anything. Just listen. And then it'll be your turn to talk and your partner will listen. And then I'll give you just a minute at the end to say what you need to say to each other. So is that clear what we're going to do? Monologue, no interrupting. If you're not interrupted, 90 seconds or so is actually a pretty long time. So. In order to figure out who goes first, it will be the person with the shortest hair. So, <laughs> and here, have you all identified that or do you need a tiebreaker? Figured that out? Okay, so the first question is this. What, what brings aliveness to you? What enlivens you? Short-haired person, please tell your partner, what brings you most fully alive? What does your soul most long for? It's time for you to thank your partner. And now it's time for the long-haired contingent to say their piece. So what is it? What is it that your soul most longs for? Time to begin. It's about time to go to bed, so another minute or two of attention here. So that was heart speak for many of you. I looked around and I saw some really wonderful exchanges going on. 
How was that for you? Did you, yes, good, got something out of that? All right, okay. All you partners, everybody, good job. How many of you had some kind of insight about something? Just raise your hand if something came to you. Wonderful, that's great. So we'll hold those insights and we'll begin to, tomorrow we'll be um, writing, experiential writing. And now it's time to go to bed. I always go to bed with the same lullaby and it's a Hebrew lullaby. And what it, what it does is it invokes the one and then it invokes the four archangels on different sides of your body. So Oriel, um, the light of God before you, and then it will be Raphael, the healer of God behind you. To your right will be um, Michael, the likeness of God. To your left will be Gabriel, the strength of God. And then the best part, around your head and then wrapping you in her wings the Shekhinah, the Divine Feminine, um, God the Mother. And then you can go to sleep all snuggled up in the wings of the Shekhinah. So I'm not a singer, but I do the best I can. So get ready for a lullaby. Be little inside and wait to be tucked in. Hashem, Hashem, Elohei Israel, Mimini, Michael, Mismoli Gabriel, Milfona. Sleep with the angels, sleep in peace, and maybe tonight you'll have a dream and the light within you will remind you of who you really are. Good night. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you.